Welcome into the Coach Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River and the River Sports Network as we broadcast live from City Market Grill and Buffet as we do every Tuesday at 7 o'clock. And as Coach always does, he's kind of hidden it behind the helmet a little bit today. He's got some, uh, what do you got in there, Coach? Some shrimp and fish. <laughs> drowned in uh, ranch. ranch. Yeah, yeah, drowned in, in yeah. a ranch again. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Adam Stocks along with Lance Bowman, uh, Coach Rush Probst. No visor. Left the visor at the office. Yeah. That's uh, – that's uh, you get. We get to see his his uh, practice here today, yeah, and so. appreciate anybody that came out as well here at uh, City Market Grill and Buffet. We invite you to come out every time uh, that we do this on Tuesdays. And uh, students, by the way, eat for just ten dollars. That includes a drink, and it's all you can eat uh, the buffet here. So, Coach, uh, let's start off with the game at Eufaula. Uh, Forty six to thirty two was the final score. Just give us a synopsis of it, and then we've got some uh, highlights that we're going to take a look at a little bit later. Well. That's why I swallowed my shrimp. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the difference in the game was the 14 point that we left on the field uh, from the two fumbled kickoffs. I mean, if you take, if you don't turn the ball over on kickoffs inside the 15, uh, then, you know, the game's pretty even. And I think, I hate to say it like this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Usually in one score games, Inside of two minutes, my record's pretty good. I mean, we've been really, really, really fortunate over the years to be able to run a two-minute drill or a minute drill or whatever. Now, I have been beat. cost me a state championship one time with 41 seconds to go. But but more times than none, we're going to win most times uh, if we got the ball last <clears throat> and we're down a score. So, I felt – pretty confident in what we'd done there's a few things we had not shown um we'd, we'd shot a lot of bullets there's no doubt about it but we still had a few in the holster out of our zebra package that we'll talk about later on but but the two fumbles killed us man that's that's the difference in the game in my opinion i mean there's other things out there that beat us but um you know one one thing we did this week and you know i learned this a long time ago um Eddie Robinson, coach, long-time coach at Grambling, coach 50 years. I, he's sitting in front of a high school clinic one time. It was, a, it was a Nike clinic. And I was speaking at the clinic, and I was not speaking at the time, but I was in there listening to another high school speaker. I think the guy was Bobby Bentley from Burns, uh, Burns South Carolina. Bobby and I are good friends. And Eddie Robinson's on the front row with a notepad. And I went – so afterward, I, I went up to Coach Robinson and said, Coach, you know, you know, outside of Alonzo Staggs and Bear Bryant at the time, your your wins are right there with them. And then he eventually went ahead of those guys, if you remember. And, uh, and at the time, he may had already had the record. And I said, why – what could you learn 50 years of coaching? And he said, Coach Rush, he said uh, – he said, um, when you quit learning in this game, it's time to retire, and I, I, I've not stopped learning. And so, you know, that I thought that was really impressive. I mean, one of the most impressive things I'd seen in, in maybe ever. Well, <clears throat> I go back to 1983, and a guy named Carl Madison, y'all don't know him, he's a very successful coach down in North Florida. And he made a statement one time, and this fits Pell City to the T. He said, you got to learn how to lose before you learn how to win. What he meant to say, what he was saying, because he, he would say that, but what he, when he got into his talk, he'd say, the why factor. Why are you losing games? And so you got to teach them why you're losing games first before they understand on how to win games. I think we assume sometimes as football coaches that kids know more than they really know. Because every Saturday, my kids, you know, I've had, Steph and I have raised four boys, three girls, and, you know, obviously John David's still playing. He's a junior. And, you know, they don't watch a lot of football. You know, they're, they play the Madden and they play the video games and they do the stuff they do. So, 
there's things they just don't know why the game is lost. They don't study it like we do. So we did a we did a clip this week called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Except we reversed the role. We went ugly, bad, good. So <clears throat> on Sunday, we sit down and I'm repeating myself today because I did a I do a podcast out of South Georgia every, every bunch of people listen to it, but I was saying the same thing to them down there today. I do it every Tuesday at noon. You you put up the ugly, and the, and you see it. And, and but here's the key to it: like, okay, offensive linemen are in a room with the offensive line, and every week they've got their coach watching tape. And they're sitting there watching tape, and they go, Malik, why did you not down block? Why did we not pass this off? Why did we miss the double team? Well, that situation, those five, six, seven linemen are in there, and they see that every week. So guess what? There's not as much peer pressure to that. There is, there is a little bit embarrassment, you know, when you're pointed out, especially if the coach is animated a little bit, which we do. And, but when you take the whole team, I took the whole team, and I set them down Sunday in front of, in front of a screen. I ran it for the most part. I let the coordinators come up and define some things. So now everybody on the team sees L.J. Berry fumble the ball. Everybody saw Marquise Bedford fumble the kickoff. Everybody saw Aldridge, the center, pass set when he should have been run blocking it, that, that got a tackle behind the line when we were driving to start the second half. So everybody sees the ugly stuff. So there's a lot more pressure because every coach sees it, every player sees it, every, everybody. So it's, the pressure is enormous. And so that part, I think, really puts a player that messes up really bad, whether it's poor effort or poor technique or the fundamental of the, you know, like we were too much reaching and grabbing on defense. You know, we were not tackling very well, especially in the second half when we got tired. So they start to see that, and they start to click. Man, now I can see it. And you guess what? That wide receiver coach and that wide receiver sees why the DB, L.J. Berry, and J.J. gets beat on just deep balls. Deep balls just run right by them. Why? Well, they're in zone coverage. And they're supposed to be eight yards backpedaling, and they're they're peeking some. Their eyes are somewhere they're not supposed to be. So now they've lost the technique of the position, and that guy just runs right by them. So everybody sees that. So we showed all the ugly, then we showed all the bad, and then we showed some good. Because I mean, Lord Caleb Gross had a career night, and uh, you know, I mean, Kirby Smart text this week and said, "Man, this kid's a real good player." And so if Kirby's saying it, trust me, you know, and of course Hugh knows it too, but there's going to be more to know it too. So anyway, with all that being said, I thought today and yesterday our practices were better because of this. And, and, but again, it goes back to the catastrophic plays. It goes back to this, we are battling for consistency. That's what I said earlier today. We are battling because the guy, the guy asked me, Phil Jones said, Rush, what, what, what's your win total? Where do you want to be at the end of the year? And I said, well, when I was down there, we went four and six the first year. And I said, I'm not looking for a win total. I'm looking for consistency in our football team. And that's what we're lacking now is consistency in our play on all levels, whether it be special teams, defense, offense, everything. So I think moving forward – I don't think you put a win total on anything, you know. Uh, I think if we if we become a consistent football team in the things that we're doing and we build the culture right, the practice habits, are and they are getting better. Our practice habits are getting better. I think we had one player on offense today whose effort was not very good. Um, but for the most part, I thought our effort was good today, and Tuesdays is always the toughest day because now you're into that third day of practice, and it's hard. So I think, you know, that will translate into more consistency, which will also 
transition into more wins, and that's that's how you got to look at it. So you come out of the season with some wins, but being a better practice team, being more a consistent team on all levels, and then you got something to build on. Coach, staying with the Eufaula game, you talked about some of the key mistakes and the the difference in the 14 points when we fumbled deep in our own territory on kickoff returns. But it was also a game of quarters. Got down 15-3 and then really possibly had one of the most dominant quarters we've had for the season. I mean, the second quarter was fantastic and then struggled in the third quarter, kind of hoping that the, the second half would repeat the first half. But you talked about your guys getting fatigued. And I wanted to ask you one specific aspect of the game that was kind of where we needed to get over the hump there in the fourth quarter, and we just really struggled to stop their quarterback on the belly read option. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's a lot of reasons for it. One, they had not shown that a lot. The quarterback pulling the ball on belly read, he'd only run the ball twice all year. Um, I, you know, so we wasn't prepared on that. And um, I think our coaches will admit that. Um you know, because they had not shown a lot of it. And, you know, all they had shown is counter and jet sweep. Hand the ball off speed on the perimeter and run counter run inside. That's really all they had shown. And the quarterback throwing the number four, you know. But then zero emerges is, is better than we thought. And, you know, they're a pretty good football team. I mean, you know, they're, they, they're, they are. They're, they got a good football team. They beat Stan O'Fellmore early in the year. And, I mean, there's no way that should have happened. You know, they lose to Enterprise right off the gate, and Enterprise is real good. You know, they're one of the top four teams in 7A in South in South Alabama. So, you know, I think uh, – and then they lost to Pike Road, who's another really good 6A football team down south. So, you know, they got a good football team. They've always had athletes down there. And, and uh, of course, I was down there for four or five years, and we, we had good athletes. So, I think uh, when you look at the Ufala game um, – yeah, you're right. Second quarter, we've scored 20. We went in 25-18 and a half, so I guess we scored 22 points in the second quarter. And I think if we could have extended the quarter even more, we'd have scored more because we were hot in the second quarter. Here's the deal in the third quarter that bothered me. We came out flat. There's no question. But defensively, we got a three and out fast. So defensively, we stopped them. I think it's the last time we stopped them. Offensively, we get the ball and we're seven, nine, five, six. All of a sudden, we get down there and it's second and four, second and five. And Ham, our center, just snapped the ball and goes into pass set. He misses the signal. And you just can't. So, 10 people got the signal. He didn't get the signal. There's no way. So, and some of that's fatigue and mental fatigue. And because physical fatigue becomes mental fatigue, he misses the call, he passes it, guy runs upfield and tackles it for a seven-yard loss, kills the drive. From that moment on, they gained the momentum, and we lost the momentum, and here they come. They go score, we go three and out, they go score, then we drive and score to tie the game at 32. And then – Bam, you know, and then the, and then they score again. So we're still in the game, and then we fumble. Bepper fumbles the kickoff, and they got it, and they go score, and boom, it's it's ball game. So, and then fatigue set in at about the six minute mark. Fatigue set in, and I think a lot of that is when you don't like, you know, our off season will start in December. You know, we'll we'll start probably that sat Monday after Thanksgiving is when we'll start our off season program. And so we'll get the month of December, January, February, March, April leading into May. So we lost all that. We didn't have any of that. And so that's when you're getting stronger, you're learning the game of football, you're you know, you're you know, doing the things you gotta do in the off season to become a better football team. You know, from a conditioning standpoint. And then we lost spring practice. We had no spring practice. Um, so I think that's a lot of our issues. I think that's uh, – and, and, and we're practicing with 60-something kids. So now we made a decision last week to move our ninth grade up with us to give us 100 kids to practice with. And that's how you have to, you have to have really 90 to 105 kids to practice 
when you got 60 something kids you are going to thin down you're going to give out Hugh Freeze and I had this conversation last Thursday and he said Rush I'm telling you we don't have the depth at Auburn yet to practice like you and I both know how to practice and he said we are giving out in ball games and sure enough when I watched the George Auburn game in the fourth quarter they were so tackled they were so tired they couldn't even tackle they couldn't even run the ball and tackle and uh, and I think there's a lot of merit to us too. The same way, I just think you give out because now your 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 bodies you're, you're repping so much in practice, and your bodies are wearing down. And because you've got to get to that level of execution, but then you're tired. And then as the game goes off, you can't substitute. You know, we don't have. You need you need seven to eight linemen to substitute like like ham should be getting a, a a full rested series in the first half a full rested series in the second half um i think uh stevenson lance stevenson i think the same way i think it wouldn't wouldn't hurt for michael snow to take one series off or a malik take one series off you know, but some of the big heavies need. And, like, d lineman wise I mean, you can't expect those guys to play every series. So, you know, we're playing with two linebackers. You know, we don't have that. We don't have a number two unit, the linebacker unit yet. You know, our best probably linebackers after our two are freshmen. So, you know, that's that's the issue we've got right now is our just true depth. And I think it goes back, not to be critical of the past because I've done a lot of that, is that when you only have 22 sophomores, we should have 42 sophomores. You know, because like right now we've got 45 freshmen playing football. We must retain 40 of those kids, you know, and then next year maybe retain 45 of those kids. So we've got to get that number to where we're 25 to 30 seniors, 30 to 35 juniors, 35 to 40 sophomores, and then 50 freshmen. Once we get those numbers right, then our depth will be what we need to do. We practice like we need to, and we can substitute in the ball game without it killing us when we put people in that are really not ready to play yet. All right, let's take a uh, timeout. When we come back, we've got some uh, good highlights that we're going to take a look at from the Eufaula game. We've got uh, – I want to talk about your trip down to Auburn. Uh, coach uh, being very gracious down there, allowing you and the coaching staff and the players to watch practice at Auburn uh, prior to that big Georgia game last weekend and, and practice in their facilities as well. And, of course, it's Oxford week as well for the Pell City Panthers. Stick around. The Rush Probe Show continues here on the River Sports Network. I'm Brian Collins with Two Wheel Heaven Power Sports in Pell City. From sales to service to parts, our goal at Two Wheel Heaven Power Sports is to meet all your ATV, side by side, and motorcycle needs. And we finance. We have experienced staff and certified technicians on hand in our service department. And we also have a wide variety of accessories, riding gear. We'll keep you looking good. Two Wheel Heaven Power Sports on Comer Avenue or call 205 473 0143. Hello everyone, Dale Benton of Benton Nissan. We are proud to support the people we live with, work with, play with, and pray with. We truly care about selling quality vehicles and providing our customers with exceptional service. Come shop our huge new inventory of Nissan cars, trucks, and SUVs, as well as our certified pre-owned inventory. Benton Nissan, serving three locations, Bessemer, Hoover, and Oxford. Your friend in the car business. This is the sound of Frankenmuth Insurance, hard at work. We protect so you can sleep and dream. Frankly speaking, insurance should be the last thing on your mind, which is good because it's the first thing on ours every day. Frankenmuth Insurance. It's game day. And from all of us at Bucks Island, from the Loft Tackle Store, from the team in service, from the team in parts, from the sales team, From the Bucks Island family, good luck and go get them, boys. Treating our customers the way we want to be treated since 1948. BucksIsland.com or call 1-800-I'M-READY. Let our team help you win on the water. 
Your exclusive Bobcat dealer for East Central Alabama is Bobcat of Gadsden. And they're a full-line Bobcat dealer for construction and agriculture. They specialize in parts, service, sales, and rentals. And right now, they have great financing rates. Bobcat of Gadsden, same-day delivery on rentals, factory-trained service technicians, and they're ready to serve you. Call 256-563-4001. If you're looking for the hottest fashion trends, then shop Celeste Heavenly Boutique in Pell City, where you will find the latest styles for women, juniors, infants, and toddlers. And Celeste has great gift ideas for every occasion, jewelry and accessories, candles, household items, pet products, and more. New arrivals daily with shipping and free gift wrap available. Celeste Heavenly Boutique, a boutique for all generations. If you're thinking about buying your first home, then Coosa Valley Mortgage can help you unlock the door to home ownership with first-time home buyer programs that can put you in the home of your dreams. Conventional, FHA, USDA, VA, or construction perm options. We are a local family serving local families since 1996. Coosa Valley Mortgage, we've got you covered. Equal housing lender, NMLS 198757. Welcome back to the Rush Probe Show here on 94.1 FM, The River, and The River Sports Network. Adam Stocks along with Lance Bowman and, of course, Coach Rush Probe's joining us as we do every Tuesday. 7 o'clock is when we crank it up here at City Market Grill and Buffet. Come on out, have a good meal with us, and uh, get to listen to some football and talk some football with uh, Coach Probst. And Coach, we talked about that. You fall a game again, a final score, 46-32. to 32. We got some, uh, some of the highlights here. There's a lot of number four in these highlights, obviously. We talked about Caleb and uh, the big game that he had. And I want to talk about his, his opportunities at the next level as well, I think, as those are, are growing, those opportunities. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the scoring for Pell City, starting off with Jake Blackstone, remaining perfect on the season with a 27-yard field goal right here. Well, we had a good drive. We missed a touchdown. That's another on the bad plays. I mean, we got Caleb uh, wide open on the play before this. Nikita, for some reason, Tries to throw it and throws it right to the linebacker. He should have picked it, but he didn't. If he just all week long, he'd been dumping it over there, and he kept, that should have been a touchdown. So we come away with three instead of four. Should have came away with a touchdown right there. That was that was a mistake on our part. And then uh, let's see, we've got the 55-yard touchdown pass. Gitman shook to Caleb Gross, and uh, the PAT made it a 15 to 10 deficit for Pell City. Break this play down, and and again, talk about Caleb in motion and how that benefits us. That's our zebra package out of two back. Um, and we just throw the fast screen out there. John David made a good block. Landon um, Strong made a good block. Um, it's just a fast screen. The, the thing about zebra, zebra means Z. He plays the Z position. So we put him in the backfield. It's hard to double him from there. So because he, he could go anywhere. And he can motion back across or he could go in and out. So good block out of two guys right there. And Caleb just takes it and, and goes house on them. And uh, – you know, it's a big play. You know, it gets us back to uh, close, and and um, you know that we we were very effective with the zebra package out of two back. Now there's other zebra packages, but that was our zebra package out of two back out of our out of like I said, our what we call blue and green. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, right there. So it was 15-10 deficit after the, that uh, 55-yard touchdown pass we just saw. And then uh, they add a field goal, go up 18-10. to 10, And then we've got this uh, nice pass right here, 70-yard pass. Getman shook to, uh, to gross again on the evening. Same play that we had on the goal line that he didn't hit. He comes back the very next time and hits him. So we reloaded the play. A uh, little gator look inside there where, where we just crisscross it. And John David goes out and stutters, runs corner, uh, or he runs corner. Uh, Caleb comes out, stutters. As you can see, you can't see that. He stutters, and he hits him right down the middle versus too high. When you got two safes sitting in the middle field, that safety's got to jump one way or another. So he jumps the two corner balls. We run shakes corner to the backside to hold the other backside safety, and then he splits it. Right down the middle. Now, we have something called split, but in that situation, it's more of a uh, gator. There it is right there. You yeah. see him stutter. And, yep. I mean, it's just loaded it up, safety bit, and he hits him, and he goes and scores a touchdown, and 
we're off to the races. Yeah, Gross uh, also the two-point conversion, tying it up at 18 apiece after that right there. And then uh, closing out the first half, another Getman shook to Gross. This one a 10-yarder. This was a uh, pretty one in the back of the end zone here. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Great job here and throws it. Just just a great job. I hope we got a shot of that. Um, yeah, wheel route. Mm-hmm. We just run the wheel ball. We run deal. It's off our plane motion. So we're in empty deal, or and it's plane. And, and so plane means motion across the formation. So they've got to check all that. You know, they're in match coverage, so they're going to check all that and got to bump it right, and they didn't bump it right and left him wide open. See, so they bump it. And he's in decent position, but we got the matchup we wanted. That's a linebacker. That's not a DB. So they bumped it wrong. And um, and later on we come back and we, we overthrew Zach when they bumped it the other way. So we should have scored a touchdown there too when he overthrows him. He could have gone either way. I know you don't have that because we overthrew it, but there's another touchdown we left on the field. So we left four points and another touchdown on the field. So that's 11 more points of 25. So that's 36. We should have scored 36 in the first half. So we go into the locker room, uh, Pell City up 25-18. to 18. And going into the locker room, you were talking with the Senator Lance Bell on the sidelines there, and, and you said the next six minutes in the third quarter is going to be crucial. And you, you alluded to it earlier. We came out defensively. We stoned them right there, got the ball back, and uh, just didn't work out well. So those, those six minutes, break those six minutes down for us before we look at uh, one more highlight here, a couple more highlights. But break those six minutes down. Two and a half minutes into it, 2.15 into it, we got to stop. So we do exactly what the defense, what we talked about at halftime. So now we get the ball, we drive. We've taken about two minutes off the clock. So four minutes into it and we're driving. And all of a sudden, a catastrophic mistake. And they blow us up in the backfield. Uh, we lose. We end up having to punt the football. So now the momentum completely switches. So think about this. We hit the first touchdown. We hit the second touchdown. We're up 36-18 and a half. We come back and we don't have do this and we drive down. We're at, you know, we're at 43, you know, 43-18 pretty quick if we do what we're supposed to do. Now they play in catch-up, so it takes them. The ability to run the football with a quarterback is completely taken away just three plays. The Gidman Shook mistake, the Gidman Shook mistake, although he had some good plays and played a really good game, you know, um, you take those eleven points and leave them, leave them out there, and don't and don't cash in. You know, allow them to be in striking distance where now they can throw or they can run the little zone read, the little read play in there with the quarterback, and continue to run the football and it stretches thin. So that that's why the first six minutes are so. You know, here's the deal too: high school football is different than college football. You only got forty eight minutes, so. You know, it, it it's you, you got to squeeze it every second you can, you know, and and know that every possession is crucial, every play is crucial, and you have to maximize your effort during that capsule of time of of making sure it can't be my bad or we'll get it the next time and all that kind of stuff. We we have to execute and we got to do a better job of executing because we had. We had a really good plan now. We really did, especially offensively. I think we ended up with 388 yards offense, and um, we should have had about 450. So uh, you follow scores twice in the third. They take the lead 32-25, to 25, and then our final score here, another touchdown, fourth touchdown run. We needed less than a, a, a yard on this one, and uh, got, the, got the big boys out there, and it just squirts out for a 30-yard touchdown run. Push. This is the push play that you see the Eagles with, mm-hmm. and you get Hunter and Jalen in there, and it worked, and Caleb Strong, and he pushes through there, and in a rugby style, that's just rugby style, just big heavies blowing them out, and you know we did it again, and we jump off sides, and that cost us uh, a, a possession too, so um, we lean, and they get us for leaning, so I mean, again. A, 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 a mistake that you just can't have right there. Coach, uh, 
the highlights were a, a Caleb Gross show, and I know right. Adam's going to ask you a, a similar question. You've, um, I'm going to phrase it this way. You've turned out a lot of college players over your career. And one of the things that, that I've noticed is that guys um, can play at the college level, but that's, that's multi-layered. You can have a small college player. You can have an FCS player. You can have an FBS player, and then you could have an SEC Power 5 type, type guy. No doubt. Talk about what it takes to make it all the way to the top of that group. Some of it's just God-gifted ability. Well, you know, I've had three five-star players in my career, which is not a lot. You know, Chad Jackson, um, Kerry Murphy, a D-lineman, Parade All-American, um, John Parker was a Parade All-American, but he was a four-star. J.J. Um, Peterson, uh, linebacker in Colquitt, was a phenomenal athlete. I mean, just, I mean, had more. I mean, Saban ranked him the second best defensive prospect he'd ever, ever graded out. And um, I think that you you have a special talent with kids, but they have to develop. Caleb Gross has tremendous talent, but he's not been in a really good off-season program. He's not been in any kind of de- speed enhancement development. He's not been in any kind of polish to where he's perfected his routes or perfected his ability to play the Wildcat quarterback spot. So I think what Bill Clark and I was talking about today, he's a kid – that I think may be more valuable to somebody that jumps on him because they're going to say, well, golly, Rush ain't been there for four months. So we're not getting a finished product here. We're getting a kid who needs to, needs more development, but he has great potential. I think he's definitely an SEC guy. Um, you know, we had 13 catches for 238 yards and three touchdowns, and then he uh, ran for one. Three touchdown passes, and he ran for one. Uh, he's also a six six high jumper, and um, you know that shows you a little bit about his his explosiveness. And he's one of the strongest kids on our team, if not the strongest, pound for pound. So I think that you'll see him play in the SEC. Uh, I think somebody will pull pull it late. You know the problem is that you know like you told me on Thursday, they've already got in their mind who they want. Like, they brought in all their 18 commitments for the Georgia game, and they brought in about 12 players that already committed to other schools. And, uh, you know, two of them from school that I came from at Colquitt that have committed to Georgia, Nye Carr and uh, the four-star receiver and the five-star tight end. Oh, his name his name slipped me. I'm gonna have to get my wife to help me with the, with the name, but I think um, um, that's it's a college coach right there. <laughs> um, so his his ability as a um, football player is only going to get better, and I think he's not the only one. I think Mike Snow is another one that I think has tremendous ability that. Uh, you know, we'll get there. I think there's others on our football team. Hunter Otwell, L.J. Berry. Um, definitely Hunter Otwell and L.J. Berry will sign. Don't know what level yet, but they're definitely going to sign. And then you throw in on offense, it's going to be uh, Caleb Bedford. Um, I think Snow for sure. Mullen's a good possibility. Um, you know, and – Aldridge and, and, and Stevenson could too. I mean, I mean, I think Lance could too. Uh, it may not be at, at a high, maybe NAI level. You know, like you just talked about, it may be a lower level, but it's still money paid for. I mean, my son was heading to Graceland, Iowa, in an NAI school that uh, takes forty-two thousand dollars to go to school there, and they were going to give him about thirty-seven or thirty-eight thousand to go to school, and then all of a sudden, West Georgia. Dropped it on, you know, dropped scholarship on him, you know, a week before signing date. So, less than a week. I think it was the weekend before the Wednesday signing date. So, and then now they're going D1. They announced a couple of weeks ago. So, I think, 
You know, we got some kids. And, and here's, here's the deal. If you play for us and you stay in our program and you're a senior and you start for us as a senior, you should have, an, have the opportunity to go play at some level and receive academic, not excuse me, athletic money from a university to go play. And it's like I told uh, Marquise Bedford. I said, let's just say that Graceland's your only offer. I'm just using them for an example. Or Cumberland out of Tennessee. They're in AIA. And it costs thirty thousand dollars to go to school. And they give you twenty five and you gotta come out of pocket five. Think about that, son. That five thousand dollars for four or five years that you run up as on a loan, so what? You got an education. But if you don't go because you let five thousand dollars worry you that you can't afford it then, you know, think about all the people that don't get anything, that go get a student loan, and they run up eighty, ninety, hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars $150,000 worth of student loans. You know, so I think with that being said, um, that's, that's what I sell parents all the time. Take the money, regardless if it's full or not, you know, and, and go to get you an education. And I, and I think that's the mindset we got to develop here. Because, you know, I talk to a lot of kids at Pell City. I mean, I go to the lunchroom one day a week, and I talk to kids. And I'll sit down and talk to them, and I ask them what they're going to do after school. It amazes me on how many say they're just going to go to work. Why? Why? we we got to start pushing that envelope, too, academically, that every kid needs to at least have a hope or a vision to go get a another education and a higher education because y'all know where this world is now yeah i know there's technical trade schools and we got to have electricians and plumbers and all that stuff but you know and, and, and look i don't beneath any of that but at the same time when they're in the ninth grade and tenth grade that should be their benchmark that every kid should be looking at that benchmark of what can i do to provide for my family at a higher level and that's, I think, going to college and getting an education. If we can do it at Caldwell County High School in rural South Georgia with how I many we have stuff, 131 kids in 10 years, um, and those kids had nothing, absolutely nothing, and they went and they would be going in there and take a loan out. And if they went to a Cumberland or one of those schools, you know, we had, I know we had a ton of them that went on to play in the SEC and the ACC and – Big Ten and everywhere else. But I, I just push that. I mean, I, and I think where Steph and I have been most proud is we had a six-year run that every senior signed. Every senior on our football team that played for us, if they started, they signed. And you're signing 21, 19, 18, 20 every year. And when you sit up in front of that dang cafeteria like we had – and there's all the parents, the grandparents, and tears are rolling down grandparents' and mothers' eyes. And, they're, and, and I'd say 85 to 90% of them are first-generation college students. That's better to me than winning a state championship. I ain't going to lie to you. That signing day for those kids to, to see that and the parents crying, grandparents crying, and they're first-generation, to me, that's – that, that's the reason you coach football, and that's the reason you're in education, is to push your kids to the, to the highest of limits. And, and I think we have to – that's part of our mission here too. The uh, Rush Probe Show continues. We're going to take a quick timeout. We've got a, a really good segment coming up. Lance will tell you about it here in a second. Still want to talk Florida and Georgia. A lot of uh, news on NIL there. I want to get your thoughts on on that. Uh, do you see it on the horizon here in Alabama? We'll talk about that coming up. I do want to talk about uh, you guys going down to Auburn and what you guys were able to do and see and experience down there as well. But as we do here during the Rush Probe Show, Lance, I know you've got a, a really cool segment, uh, Panther Legends. Who we got it on this week? Yeah, we're going to talk about Ken Rowe and he's you know each week I think man this is my favorite story yet but uh, Ken Rowe is one of those guys that comes from the opposite end of the spectrum uh, he barely got a sniff from anybody then gets bailed at the last minute bailed out at the last minute lo and behold by Bobby Bowden it's a fantastic story and his first love was baseball and 
There was a 19-year-old coach that he had when he was about 17, one Rush Probst, <laughs> uh, Coach Ken Rowe back in the day, back yeah. in the late 70s. And uh, that is going to be this week's Panther legend on the River Sports Network. Ken Rowe became a starter for Pell City during his sophomore season in 1977 and started every game for the remainder of his Panther career. A team captain and all-state linebacker during his senior season, Rowe led the 1979 Pell City defense to a regional championship and a state playoff berth. After his outstanding high school career, the college signing period came and went without Rowe getting a single Division I offer. However, legendary Florida State head coach Bobby Bowden had lost out on some key recruits and found himself with available scholarship. Bowden called up Pell City coach Pete Rich a few days before the start of the 1980 practices and offered Rowe a scholarship, adding, I knew that any kid that played for Pete Rich had to be tough. Ken made the drive to Tallahassee where he soon realized FSU's linebacker coach Gene McDowell was in disbelief that the undersized Rowe was a part of his linebacker group. McDowell banished the freshman to the scout team and even told Ken that he would never play a down at FSU. For his part, Rowe was growing more homesick by the day and it took a conversation with his dad to keep him from driving back to Pell City. Ultimately, Coach McDowell had to concede that Bobby Bowden just had a special sense about players and that he had been right about Rowe. Early into his sophomore year, Ken wasn't just starting for the Knowles, but the devastating hitter racked up 20 tackles against Nebraska. He would go on to eclipse the 20 tackle mark again with 23 stops against Pittsburgh and a career high 24 tackles against the Miami Hurricanes. And by his junior season, McDowell said Rowe was the best tackling linebacker he had ever coached at FSU. Rowe finished his Seminole career with almost 300 tackles during his final two seasons and even though it has been 40 years since his last game for the Garnet and Gold, Ken Rowe is still ranked seventh all time in tackles for Florida State University. Named to the All-South team and one of two players to be awarded the Golden Chief Leadership Award by Coach Bowden following the 1983 season, Rowe was then contacted by the NFL's Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the CFL's Saskatchewan Rough Riders before being drafted by the USFL's Jacksonville Bulls. Ken Rowe, Class of 1980, Panther legend. Let Griffin Laser Engraving help you with all of your custom laser engraving needs, power coating, and UV color printing. And Griffin Laser Engraving is your local authorized Yeti dealer where you can find everything Yeti. Stop by our showroom on Highway 78 in Lincoln and see our great selection of Yeti products, Abaco sunglasses, custom trophies, awards, gift ideas, and more. Griffin Laser Engraving. We make it the way you want it. Great food and great variety. It's City Market Grill and Buffet in Pell City. A great selection of meats, fish, vegetables, desserts, and the largest salad bar in the county. And of course, it's all you can eat. The City Market Grill and Buffet in the Walmart Shopping Center in Pell City. Check out their Facebook page for times and prices. City Market Grill and Buffet. Hello everyone, this is Brent Bunton from Holly Automotive in Pale City, Alabama. We are a family owned and operated local independent dealership. We have local credit unit financing available and we also offer extended warranties. And we also have Carfax report on every vehicle. If you're in the market to buy, sell, or trade, please come see me, Brent Bunton, at Holly Automotive on the corner of Florida Road and Old Coast City Road. Be sure to like and follow our Holly Automotive page on Facebook. Hey, this is Shane Ray with Stockton Mortgage. It's that time of year again where Friday nights are lit up under those stadium lights. We're thrilled to back our local high school football team. Their determination, teamwork, and community spirit reminds us what we're all about. We're not just here to help you finance your home. We're here to invest in our future, our community, our teams, and our children. So let's gear up and show our unwavering support and cheer on the Panthers this season. Jefferson State is the best choice for my education. You can get a jump start on college by completing college credit while still in high school. Or get an associate degree in one of Jeff State's high demand career programs and start earning great pay right away. How about saving thousands in tuition by starting at Jefferson State, then transferring to a four year university? And with online classes and four convenient campuses, I can earn a degree around my schedule. Find your place at Jefferson State. Registration going on now. 
The Ark Family Restaurant has been a fixture in St. Clair County for the past 93 years. Starting out on a barge in 1930, the Ark has been in its current location since 1955, bringing you the best U.S. farm-raised catfish anywhere, plus delicious shrimp, steaks, and a whole lot more. Stop by the world-famous Ark Family Restaurant on Highway 78 in Riverside and experience the tradition for yourself. The Ark Family Restaurant, where generations and traditions meet. When you're a WinSouth customer, we're with you all the time. Through the work day, into game day, dinner time, all the time. So now is the time to choose WinSouth. We're with you. Convenience, security, service. It's what we do. WinSouth. We own it. Back here on the Rush Probe Show as we broadcast here on this Tuesday live at City Market Grill and Buffet. Adam Stocks along with Lance Bowman and, of course, Coach Rush Probst as we talked about the game at Eufaula. We got Oxford coming up, and uh, it is going to be a, a heck of a football game. Oxford coming off of their first loss of the season going out of conference or out of region this past Friday like we did as well. Uh, Coach, before we move on to that in this last segment, talk a little bit about um, the hospitality and, and – just the coolness factor of, of you and the coaching staff and the players being able to go down early and experience everything you did at Auburn. And for those who might not be aware, just, just talk about what, what Coach Freeze did and, and offered you guys down there. Well, before I do, let me say something that I failed to mention last week. And, and uh, I don't know if anybody knows this, but Mike Tice, who died a few months back, um, I want to mention him because he, he was a – Mike Tice was a friend of mine, and I was a young coach when he was coaching here at Pell City, and he, and he took me under his wing a little bit. And and uh, I, I always like to tell stories about people that really – Robert Heron was a huge mentor for me at Oxford, the head coach there that won several state titles. And But Mike Tice, we were in Asheville. We'd just been an 0-10 season, and I, and, and I was an assistant coach. And uh, he, I, I remember sitting and meeting with him and talking with him and him telling me about just being a football coach. And we also came down here and designed our field house after the field house had been built here. You know, we took that plan and built it Asheville. Uh, so wanted to mention out to Coach Tice and his family and, and you know, his, his, his daughter was an unbelievable. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh, she was a great player. <laughs> but uh, – but anyway, uh, but going back to um, Coach Freeze, you know, Hugh and I have had a relationship for a long time, and, you know, we met in the mid-'90s, uh, at a, well, late-'90s, excuse me, late-'90s, we, we were at the clinic out in Dallas, and uh, we were all there, and it was Art Bryles, it was at Baylor, and uh, Gus Malzahn, myself, and Chad Morris, who's head coach at Arkansas, and... Um, I mean, there's others. Todd Dodge, you know, from South Lake Carroll, who ended up becoming a college football coach, the head coach at Texas Tech right now. Uh, he was in that deal. And there were about eight of us, and we'd get together and talk football. And, uh, you know, but Hugh and I became friends, and uh, we've kept a decent relationship over the years. And he recruited one of my players at Colquitt at Ole Miss. And, um, you know, Hugh's a good football coach. He's a lot – he and I believe a lot of the same things offensively. Um, we, you know, we believe in tempo, pace, offense, spread. You know, we were that first group of high school coaches really in the country that were into the no-huddle, fast pace stuff. You know, we all named it. Like, I named it NASCAR, Indy, and Derby, and that meant – NASCAR meant two-back. Uh, Indy meant one back. Derby meant three by one, one back. And, you know, Indy meant two by two, one back. You know, and we all we always shared ideas. So, you know, we've stayed in touch. You know, we've both been – he and I both been through trials and tribulations. And uh, we sort of kept up through all those times too. And I hope nothing but the best for him at Auburn. I think he's going to get Auburn turned around. I do. He's recruiting at a high level. Uh, he's innovative. He thinks outside the box. 
I think Auburn has been sort of too conservative in their thought process. Now they got Hugh in there, and he'll think outside the box, and the administration now is bought into his thinking. You know, they spent a pretty penny, as Lance can tell you, man. That that facility we saw down there is unbelievable what they have. And, you know, for those kids and those and how they take care of the athletes at Auburn. So, uh, but I do appreciate him allowing us to watch them practice. I thought it was great for our kids to watch Auburn practice. You know, our kids' eyes were pretty opened up and how fast it was and how big some of the players are. And and I even told some of our players, I said, they're not big yet. They, they haven't got the, the really big players in there yet. But, uh, you know, where Auburn's a little bit deficient, he even said this, is their O-line and D-line is not to the where they need to be in the SEC. You know, so when you compare it to Alabama and Georgia and LSU and even Ole Miss now and some of that stuff, you know, I <clears> think, <throat> you know, he's he's got a ways to go, but he's, he's getting there. And uh, – but we do appreciate him giving that. And I think being able to work out in their facility and just being around that atmosphere, I appreciate him for it. And I've texted him and uh, since we've been down there and we've texted since the ball game, since the Georgia game. And he knew what he was getting into Saturday. He wasn't going to back down from it. You know, similar to our situation coming Friday night. You know, he knew Georgia's a really good football team. I know Oxford's a really good football team. But, you know, you get the best plan, you put it in, and, you know, you got to go execute and see what happens. And, you know, I hope we play as well as Auburn played Georgia is what I'm hoping, you know, because I thought they played them really well. And and it was hard for you know, me and Steph sitting there watching it. We're pulling for Auburn, obviously, and it goes freeze. But then we're pulling for one of our – players Dejon Edwards starting running back for Georgia's our guy and we raised that kid from way down and uh, you know he's a great kid you know was not highly recruited out of high school to be honest with you you know Georgia sort of like Caleb I mean you could be a late pull right there so Dale McGee trusted me and Kirby trusted me on it and it's worked out for them and in him both but I hopefully you know and it's e it's it's good to have somebody like Freeze, and he understands what I'm going through. I understand a little bit about what he's going through at Auburn, although it's a different level. It's still the same in a lot of different ways. It's still the same. So we talk, and we'll continue to talk. And I'll go down in the off season. And we'll sit down and get on the board and talk football and talk about building a program and you know talk about offensive innovative things that keep you and i've always done that i mean that's what january and february is about you you sit down and go in the think tank and you figure out what you the beauty of high school and he and i talked about this also is you got to take what you got and you got to develop around it where i think Hughes in a different situation he can recruit to what he wants done and I think that's a little bit of the difference, you know, is he can recruit into a system and we've got to develop a system of what we have and then figure out. And he did the same thing when he was in high school. He had to. So I appreciate him for it, and we'll stay we'll stay close and hope nothing but the best for, for Coach Freeze and Auburn. One of the things that uh, we talked about going in the break, Florida and Georgia making a lot of headlines with name, image, likeness. Basically, high school kids can make some some coin now, uh, just money. like college and just like pros and like coaches said, serious money. Uh, NIL in Alabama, your thoughts on it? Do you see it coming? What are you hearing? What are you thinking? How can it not come? I mean, or, or surely we're not that stupid to think that, I mean, you want to kill Alabama and Auburn in football? Georgia just passed it. So, what does a great player going to do? He going to sit here and, for the love of playing at Pell City or Oxford or Hoover or Thompson, or he can go make that kind of money? He's jumping ship. He's heading to Georgia. If we don't pass it, that's where they're going. And, you know, especially once it gets to – I was talking to somebody today from the Alabama High School Athletic Association, uh, Paul McAfee, we talked about it. And he said, Rush, I don't see how we can not do it. We have to do it. And, you know, because you got all these states around us doing it. You know, I think now that Georgia's passed it, I think the only one that hadn't passed it is, you know, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, maybe Kentucky or Tennessee, you know, but Louisiana's passed it. 
And so I'll give you an example. Juju, the quarterback from Carrollton. So it passed whenever it passed. When Within 24 hours, Juju, which is a really good player, is going to have a camp next year at Carrollton where he's going to be paid 60000 to run a quarterback camp. And he, the kid's only going to be – he's a 10th grader right now. He's going to be a junior next year. And there's also vehicles and, you know, all that kind of stuff that will be legal. You know, he's got Arch Manning coming to his camp. Uh, Joey King's the head coach here, a good friend of mine. So, look, you, you can be old-fashioned and fight it and fight it all you want to, but at the end of the day, it's like school choice. I mean, things are going to – there's change coming. And uh, so I, I I got no problem with it. And, and I think for our state, we better be what – other states are doing close by or we're going to lose quality players now they won't be a five-star or four-star stay in this state so guess what if you're nick saban at alabama or hugh freeze at Auburn, and you got a recruit and you just lost five four stars and they go to atlanta because they can get an nil deal and now you got to go to atlanta to recruit them instead of going in your backyard i mean it's crazy i mean if kirby gets his grips on them over there i mean it's gonna be hard to turn them right back to come here i can tell you that right now what, what does that mean for a coaching staff? You know, 20, I guess, 20 years ago, and depending on, on the size of the program, you know, you, you, started to see, you started to see recruiting coordinators in the high school level. And that, that's way more common now than what it was a couple of decades ago. Do you, do you anticipate an NIL director at, at a high school now? I mean, who, and who, who guides these kids? Are, are agents coming in? I mean, how does this thing unfold? I think, I think now an experienced you're going to have to have somebody at your school, whether it be the coach or an AD or someone, an administrator is going to have to have some, some experience in that. If, if, and if you don't, none of us are going to have experience, so we're going to have to learn on the run and on the fly to make sure that we're doing it right. But I don't, I don't see how it stops. I mean, um, you know, I think that it's um, – but, but I think you're going to have to have – people that know what they're doing doing it you know what i mean to, to, to make sure the kids getting what he can get and and how how that's divvied up and how it's done and you know but it's gonna be the same thing as with alabama how did the players handle bryce getting 3.5 million where the other kids getting fifty thousand? you know i was talking to as lance can tell you i was talking to the quarterback uh robbie ashford you know, and Robbie was telling me, he said, you know, it's just different, Coach. He said, you know, here I am, a $4,000 a month guy, you know, <laughs> which is roughly the 50000 he's talking about. And then quarterback Michigan State comes in, he's making a, a lot of money. I won't quote what he, exactly what he's making, but it's a lot. More than 4000 A lot huh? more than 4000 So, you know, and I think it's tough on the coaches because what do you – you're going to play the guy that's – the boosters giving you that money for three years versus are they going to ask that question? Well, why are you playing the $4,000 guy when I'm giving you this money? You know, so there, there's a lot to that now. I mean, so there's, a, there's going to be a juggling act. And, uh, you know, we've all heard Coach Saban talk about he's not happy. He's not happy about all this stuff. Needs to be some rails put on it. And I just don't see no rails being put on it. I mean, I mean, maybe there will be. How but, far away is it in, in the state of Alabama, you think? I better be not more than a year. If Georgia's passed it, we better be very, very, very proactive and um, in, in doing something or we're going to lose some quality players in this state. Because you're not going to have to worry about, as me and Paul talked about today, you're not going to have to worry about IMG. You're not going to have to worry about Gulf Shores coming and getting your players now. Mm-hmm. They're going to be coming. There's a ton of schools in Georgia that has the ability to do it. You know, and as – my wife can tell you there's a lot of multi, 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 multi million dollar farmers in South Georgia. And, you know, when you start spreading that money, uh, you know, living in those areas are a lot better when you're making that kind of money. So I, I think it's going to have to be coming pretty quick if, if everybody around us passes it. We may get another year out of it, but maybe two years before Alabama passes it. But I, but I think we're going to have to really – look into it pretty pretty hard now and i think 
what you'll see Saban and Hugh doing is they'll be pushing it, you know, for them to be able to 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 recruit from this state. You know, the, the thing in Alabama, and this is a good year. No, last year was a really good recruiting year. In Georgia, you're going to have 100 SEC prospects in that state, at least maybe 150. Where in Alabama, you only have about 30. So, um, you know, the population is different. And you got a lot of new schools that have opened up over there. And, you know, look look where Caleb Downs came from. Caleb Downs' school was not even a school 10 years ago. Mill Creek wasn't even a high school uh, when I first moved over there. Uh, Collins Hill with Travis Hunter. I mean, those, you know, Archer, um, Denmark. These, these schools are popping up, and they're not just small schools. They're, they're schools of 2,200, 2,300. And so there's, the population means there's more players. Now you add the NIL to it, you know, and, and the money starts to flow. Uh, and in facilities, you, you're going to lose players. There's just no question. I've asked a player, a particular player, or a coach of a particular player, and he told me that if something doesn't happen, he'll lose that player. Parents have already told him that they're going to go where the money is. Hmm. Uh, coach, as we wrap up here, uh, and again, if uh, if you don't make the live version on Tuesdays, we take it in its entirety, put it in the pregame show uh, as that starts on 5.30 on Fridays. As we wrap up, uh, I'll let you kind of have the mic. I know you wanted to talk about the Foot Brothers too, right? Yeah, I did. You know, Dale and David Foot came in Sunday morning for our devotion. And let me tell you something. You had to dry, dry on that deal, and then you don't have much of a soul. But those two men – did a great job with our devotion and talked about perseverance. They talked about, of course, we know his struggles with throat cancer and um, and his brother being a pastor at the church for same church for twenty eight and a half years. And uh, so, but you never know it. He works in our lunchroom for fourteen thousand dollars a year, and he's got the greatest attitude. Now, he's a world-renowned artist and all that kind of stuff, but he is a wonderful human being, both of them are, and I coach both of them uh, in baseball. And I really, it meant a lot to us to, for him to come in and, and and give us the devotion on Friday, on, excuse me, on Sunday morning. I'm very appreciative. And Ryan, uh, our, our pastor, or our team chaplain, does it for us, too, also. He's, he travels with our team and, and does a lot of stuff good spiritual work with our players well speaking of traveling with the team we had a great turnout i thought for the uh the long drive home uh after the game at eufaula shorter drive another one on the road at uh, at oxford i know you'd love to see a lot of fannies in those seats over there no doubt i, I hope our crowd can really need the same type of crowd we had at moody to be honest with you mm-hmm. you know our you know oxford and pill city is a bit of rivalry and i mean obviously for it to continue a rivalry, we're going to have to win, you know. And, uh, you know, it's been since 2012, since David Shores beat him in 2012, since the last time, I guess it's 11 years ago. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think Oxford's got a good football team there. The quarterback's a move in from Bremen, Bowden, Georgia. He brought a receiver with him and, you know, and some other guys, key guys have moved in. And they did lose the stud five-star, four-star linebacker that went to Gulf Shores. Um, it hurt them. You know, but they're playing. Here's the here's the sad part about Oxford. They're young. They don't have hardly any seniors playing uh, in key positions. I think their defense has probably three seniors that are playing, uh, corner safety, and maybe one more that rotates in. Uh, you know, but their their nose guard, two defensive tackles, linebackers, outside backers are all juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. Offensively, the quarterback's a junior. The good receiver that moved in from Lincoln is a junior, really good player. Um, running back, they got their running backs run hard. That, the thing that scares me is they don't have a great offensive line, but their backs run extremely hard. I mean, they run with physicality. One's a senior, number five, number 23 is a junior. So they do lose one running back, but they got the bulk of their receiving quarterback. So – um, you know, they're going to be good again next year. And a lot of people in Oxford will tell you that 24 will be their banner year. So, um, 
and they're, and they're good. They got a good football team this year. So, uh, I mean, they're not as I don't think they're where Clay Chaffel is, but they're good. They got a good team, and they got some really good athletes. So, uh, we got our work cut out. We're gonna have to play a perfect game to have a chance to stay in the game. And uh, so that that's the thing I've challenged our players with is look. We're going to have to play near perfect to be able to play in this game on the road. So it'll be an interesting night in Oxford. And I think, you know, I think we've got a good plan again. Uh, hopefully we can get some defensive guys back tomorrow to practice a little bit. Uh, we've got a couple of guys that are not practicing that are injured that are, you know, hopefully they can play. You know, if not, then it is going to be a long night. So, um uh, so we get those guys back. One of them will be uh, one of them will be a game time decision. We should know a little bit more about the other two tomorrow than by Thursday. So uh, uh, we should, hopefully we get those guys back and you know give us enough uh, people to withstand that. So, but I hope a crowd comes out and, and and pulls hard for us and shows great support and we're going to give it our best effort and go play and see where we are. Awesome. Hopefully we'll see you over there right down uh, I-20, a little bit east of here, uh, the Pell City Panthers, 7 o'clock kickoff, taking on the Oxford Yellow Jackets in a couple of home games after that, back home for uh, a little bit. So let's take her some business over there at Oxford. And like Coach said, last time uh, last time we beat them, it's, uh, it's been a while ago. Rock Thomas was on that team, mm-hmm. and that was a heck of a player right there. Yeah, but we sent them home with that L. All right, uh, come out and follow the Panthers again at Oxford. This Friday kickoff is 7 o'clock. Thanks, as always, to Coach Rush Probst for uh, joining us here at City Market Grill and Buffet, Lance Bowman, and thanks to everybody who came out and uh, supported the coaches' show as well. We got uh, kickoff. If you're watching the rebroadcast on Friday, we got kickoff coming up here in just a couple of minutes. Thanks so much for watching the Rush Probe Show here on the River Sports Network. Go Panthers.